Austin Gold, one of the pastors of Bellevue Christian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, writes for Christian Living Magazine, May 12, 2019, in an article entitled, The One Thing I Tell Moms of Wayward Children. He writes, about a year ago, I noticed an email from a concerned dad about his wandering young adult. His son had moved from somewhere in Canada to the Pittsburgh area. He wanted nothing to do with Christianity his parents had spent nearly two, decade, two decades instilling in him. Uncertain of what to do, his father asked if I would give his son a call and try to meet with him. It's a common story. He continues, as a young adult's pastor, I've had many conversations with parents of wandering children, with dads and moms like the one who emailed me. And admittedly, it's hard to know exactly what to tell them. Try too hard and you probably push your kids farther away. Do nothing and it feels like you're abandoning them. I told the dad who emailed me that it was unlikely his son would have any interest in a conversation with me, especially after finding out his dad had already told me everything about his life. I told him that for many young adults, there's a period of wandering as they're searching for what they believe when they won't listen to anyone's advice, no matter how insistently or eloquently it is given. And I told him that the best thing he can do for his son is pray for him and be there for him when he runs out of options he never replied to my email. Wandering young adults, more than anything else, need moms and dads who will drench the ground with tears on their behalf. They need moms who will let them wander believing, as Evelyn Wong wrote in Bride's Head Revisited, that God has already caught them with an unseen hook and an invisible line which is long enough to let them wander to the end of the world and still to bring him back with the twitch upon the thread. I believe that being behind many of the lives I've seen transformed in my years of young adult ministry are moms and dads who refuse to quit praying even when it felt hopeless, pleading with the same kind of adrenaline-filled intensity of moms who have been to, known to lift cars to save their kids, end quote. It's an age-old story that of a wandering child. Parents easily become consumed with overwhelming worry for their children who do not fail to launch. In fact, they sometimes launch much too soon and much too severely in a much too wrong direction in a world that desires to consume them. From drug and alcohol and sex addictions to a life of denial in the existence of a loving God. The streets are full of a new wave of young homeless finding a, the substitute family of lost people just like them on the streets. I've been to the major city centers. I've walked those streets and I've talked to those young people from Seattle and Portland and Chicago. I've seen those young people that say, you're my new family. Lost people, wayward children. The way we're children, their pictures cover milk cartons and department store bulletin boards. Most of us don't even pay attention to them. Our cell phones blare with the alarm of another Amber Alert, with only a very small percentage of lost children honestly ever being recovered. Lost is lost, whether rebellious runners or in the wrong place to be easily influenced or even abducted. As followers of Jesus, our hearts cry out for parents and for families and those who are lost to us and those who are lost to God. In our study of the kingdom of heaven that we've been walking through, Jesus tells us a story that describes a family's lost son. It's often called the story of the prodigal son. It's been looked at, dissected, described and preached more times than anyone can imagine. Now, next week begins Holy Week as we continue to build towards that great event in human history, the greatest event, Easter. So for our last message touching on Jesus' answer to that question he was continually presented with, what, Lord, will the kingdom of heaven be like? 
We want to go to this story to find an answer. I thought we might look at one of Jesus' greatest teachings about the response of a father to his wayward, lost son. So often this story is told and then evaluated from the perspective of the son. A son who is lost and wandering away from the teachings and values of his family. We even make our focus the son's rebelliousness and the consequences he experiences in his wayward condition. Often with the hope of this teaching, our young people, don't go this way. Don't try this yourself. But Jesus told this story because he was accused of hanging with sinners. Something that was frowned upon by the religious right of his time, those, shall we say, churchgoers. Jesus did not tell this story to teach the consequences of sin. Something the majority of lost people are painfully aware of. We seem to often forget that. Jesus tells this story to show how God views lost people. He does so in response to the accusations the religious people were making about him and the type of people he associated with. So let's try to see this story from that perspective. How Jesus and how God, and quite frankly how we, should look at lost people. It comes from Luke chapter 15, a familiar passage to many. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and following. Let me read it. You can follow along on the screen if you'd like or in your Bibles. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one was said, uh, said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I like the King James, it says, squandered his wealth in riotous living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And, I, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Well, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, and we thank you for the story Jesus teaches us 
about how you respond to lost people. So help us as we look into this passage to see your truth. And we'll praise you always in Jesus' name. Amen. Allow me to give you a little bit of commentary on this story. Because the father loved his sons, he gave to them. That probably would be the first point of the message. But I want our focus to be more intentional on the last part of this passage. But as we look at this a little bit, just think with me about the father who loved his sons. And because he loved his sons, he gave to them. Now, in this age that we're in now with the millennials and the Xers and the plethora of other labels that we give our young people, they always seem to be, they say we're in this era of children of entitlements. They always feel entitled to get things from their parents. Now, you know, you realize after the wars, then um, the, um, the industrial boom happened with all the automotive industry things taking place and all the men going back to the factories and working. And so the things that they didn't have, they suddenly were able to gain some wealth and security and things for themselves. And so the children of those people who are so often working so hard now have enough that uh, the, the parents have enough that they can give to their children. And so they want to give to their children because they have. Just like God, the father loved his sons and he gave to them. It began to be a very good thing. A father who loves his son gives to him. We're touched by that. That what we have, we want to leave. And many of you have spoken to me and say, the one thing I want to do is when I die, leave something for my kids. Really? I don't ever think that. <laughs> my son Joshua had a roommate in college who was an only son. We'll call him Sam. Sam went to a high attendance high school back east, and I know where it was. Among the students he attended with, you know, like all groups of students that go to school at a large school, you find that more at a large school than you do a small. There were the jocks, the sports kids. There were, you know, the drug kids. We used to call them the dopers that hung around together. And there was a group of people in uh, Sam's school called the goths. Those who were young men who wore black, they dyed their hair real black. They wore black dyes. They wore black lipstick and painted their fingernails black. And they wore trench coats to class. While in a science class with a mix of other students, Sam watched a science film on the screen. The goth boy sitting next to Sam raised his hand and asked the teacher in the class, could I shut the lights off so that we can see the screen better? The teacher said, that'd be okay. So the goth kid got up, walked over, switched the lights off, opened up his trench coat, and pulled out a machete. The first person he went after was Sam, my son's friend. He swung at his neck with the machete and hit him in the jaw, missed his neck, and hit him in the jaw, which saved Sam's life. The second swing, he held up his hand, and the machete hit his hand. And Sam ran out of the room while the goth young man thought that wasn't good enough and went on to the other eight kids. I don't know how many people died in that story, but Sam ran out onto the school lawn and bled out. In fact, the doctor said that they'd never seen someone lose so much blood and still survive. Sam's parents were wealthy. They had one son, Sam. By the time our son Joshua met Sam, Sam could call his father for just about anything. And Sam had it. You wonder why? Sam's father was a Christian and a leader in the Nazarene church. He had only one son, Sam. He came very, very close to losing Sam through this tragic school attack. He felt his greatest expression of love to Sam was to shower Sam whom he thought he had lost with gifts of love. Our son Joshua was almost like son number one in our story today. He became a little frustrated with Sam's situation because Joshua never had that from me. And I told him, try to put yourself in Sam's father's perspective. Try to see things from Sam's parents' point of view. They'd almost lost their son, but by an incredible miracle, they got their son back. 
their only son. It would certainly have an impact on a parent's perspective, would it not? When a father loves his son, he gives to him. We see that in this story. In our story today, told by Jesus, this father had two sons. The first was a typical firstborn. He was responsible. He took life and worked seriously. He realized if he, had, if he worked hard and stayed true to the task, he would build upon the empire his father had begun. He was up before the alarm clock. He worked at, till after the work day was finished. There was never enough time in any given day to get everything done that needed to be done and accomplished on the ranch. The firstborn son was the kind of son every father dreamed of having. And there, then there was the number two son. I would like to say, as a number two son, I fail to see how this illustration applies. <laughs> that said tongue-in-cheek. He wasn't intentionally rebellious. This number two son was just dreamy and impetuous. He was impulsive and adventurous. He had no desire to be a farmer or rancher like his father. He was a risk taker who couldn't wait for the day to leave home, to travel and explore and see the world. He wanted to experience the things of life for his own self. These two boys were total opposites, and they both had an, inc an incredible inheritance. One day they would each get half of their father's properties, the land, and within this culture, the vineyards, the cattle, the sheep, the goats, the donkeys, all of the material wealth the father had worked so hard to develop. One day, when son number two could stand it no longer, he went to his father and told him how he felt. Why wait until I'm old? Like the commercial, he blared out, it's my money, and I want it now. Give me my share of the inheritance and I'm out of here. I want to live. I want to experience the fullness of life. Come on, Dad. So the father, loving his son, divided the property. All of the cattle and the sheep and the land. And he sold the number two son's half. That left the father with one half of what he had once had. What he had worked so hard to build. Think about that. One half gone. Verse 13 of this passage tells us the number two son, after the assets were liquidated, he took all that he had and set off to see the world. He stepped into a world he had been isolated from. And in his ignorance, naivety, and gullibility, Scripture tells us he squandered his wealth on wild living. And like my good friend always says, to a point or for a season. He partied. He had worldly fun in the sinful nature described so well in Galatians chapter 5. He gambled. He bought impulsively and frivolously. He had worldly fun without thinking about tomorrow. He built superficial relationships with fair-weathered friends. So long as he was buying the drinks, they backslapped him and told him he was great, he was the best. What this number two son did not know, but very quickly found out, is that there is evil in the world, people and forces, that were there just waiting to pounce on the innocent. And with that evil comes the incredible devastation of something called loss of innocence, where a person hides in shame because they have lost their radiant glow and are now naked, as in the garden account found in Genesis chapter 3. Adam, what have you done? Who told you you were naked? It reminds me of the young German boy of about 18 or 19 years old who came from a wealthy home. He wanted to take his traveler's checks and his expensive camera equipment and his backpack, and he wanted to walk across America. I met him when he, was, came, when he came crawling back to Pacific Garden Mission in South Chicago. 
It was a cold January night in that windy city. He came in with a pair of tan slacks on, and that's it. Good thing he wasn't wearing jeans. No shirt, no shoes, no pack, no camera, no money. Completely stripped of everything of value. He was cold and he was crying. Think about it a minute here. This young Aryan race white boy naively walking through South Chicago at night. Wow. It was a miracle he was alive. Those of us who worked at the mission and had learned to navigate the inner city and had grown street smart, we almost laughed at this young German boy in his ignorance. What were you thinking? Walking through South Chicago with a camera? In the story Jesus tells, we're told this number two son's money quickly ran out and was soon gone. We were also told there is severe famine in the land. Did you get that in the passage? What does that tell us from what we know? That the land of this number two son was in this country was, according to Levitical law, against God and his plan. That's why God causes famine to get our attention. People were not following God. This number two son, for the first time in his life, got hungry. I do not know what that's like. Some of you may. Life was no longer so great for him. He was no longer living in the luxury of his daddy's care. His good time friends were long gone, moving on to their next victim. And this young man, our number two son, was literally starving to death. He had no real understanding of how to survive. He had no street smarts. He did not know how to navigate outside the comfort of his home. Here he was, far from home in a foreign country with no way to survive. Can you imagine? So he hires himself out as an indentured servant. That's a nice word for slave. And the only work he could find was feeding pigs. Now, we're in cattle country here. The Midwest is for pigs. Please get within this culture, though. Pigs. To a Jewish young man, the most disgusting, vile, unclean animal ever created. He had to walk out among them without any Wellingtons. He had to get their smell on his skin. It goes into your skin. And while they, the pigs, ate voraciously, he starved. He had literally become lower than stinking pigs. And at his lowest point, he remembered home. A warm bed, clean living, good food, and more than anything else, the feeling of love and belonging given to him by his father. Verse 17 tells us he came to his senses. He would tuck his tail between his legs and go home. He would return to his family. He would declare his remorse and repentance and tell his father, I have sinned. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But if you'll have me as your servant, I will serve. And herein we are given a description of how God sees lost people. A lesson for us all. First, number one, the father seeks. He looks on down the road. Do you get that in the passage? He looks on down the road. He sees. He takes notice. He looks for in order to find that which was lost to him. Please get this. Look at the passage. The father saw the son a long way off. That tells us he was looking for his son. I can only imagine every single day pausing to look down the road in hopes of his son's return with a heaviness in his heart wondering and as in our introduction, praying diligently for his son's well-being, knowing full well that if his son were still alive, it was a miracle. A father looks for, he longs for, the return of his wayward child. That is the way God feels about lost people. That is the way God feels about those who have gone away from him to explore the reality of life on their own without him. 
And if you're a parent of a wayward son or daughter this morning, you understand. Words do not express the feelings you have as if a part of you is lost with them. And as a person who now walks with Jesus, you feel that in some way you may have had a part in their wandering. Maybe you tried just a little too hard. Maybe you modeled what you learned from your parents, which wasn't all that healthy. And maybe you did not try hard enough. And maybe, with the personalities involved between you and your child, it really would not have mattered what you did. They'd still wander. I love what one very wise person once told me that when they talked to their uh, adult child who had some remorse over their life. They told their child, they said, hey, I'm sorry, you did not come with an instruction manual. I genuinely did the best I could with what I had to work with. But our, in our image of God from the story of Jesus, we see that the father never stops looking for his lost son. And that's the key. Because God as our Heavenly Father is that way with every one of us. He never gives up on our return to Him. And in that image comes a lesson for us all. We never should give up on lost child, our lost child either. What will the kingdom of heaven be like, Jesus was asked. It will be like a father who loves so much, he never quits looking for our return. Secondly, Jesus teaches us the Father has compassion. He has compassion. Now, I put that in present tense on purpose. Not had compassion. A Father has compassion. Compassion, sympathetic pity, and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. For those who, who, for those who have difficulty understanding really what compassion is, it may be the easiest to see what compassion is not. Compassion is not mocking. It is not laughing at another stumble that another stumble and fall. It is not Nelson Munt saying, ha ha. And it is not shame. It is not tongue clicking disappointment. It is not, I told you so. It is not looking down upon. It is not disgust. Well, look who's coming back with their tail between their legs. Ha, I told you you would be back. Yeah, now what do you want? As a father, it is the easiest thing in the world to correct and lecture, especially when a lost child is needing our help. Believe me, I know. I have three sons. I've, I have heard from so many parents of wayward children almost smugly explaining to me that they had warned their son or daughter and that their wandering child had received exactly what they deserved. Really? That, my friends, is not compassion. I'm so very glad the God we serve is compassionate. Jesus teaches us the Father has compassion on a wayward child. Take a moment and just imagine the son's condition. Get with it a little bit. Clothing was very scarce in these days. They did not have mills producing masses of materials for clothing. They didn't have Goodwill stores with bales of used clothing out behind the stores to ship to a foreign country. Everything, whether flax for linen or wool or cotton, had to be hand-woven and handmade. It was very costly and very time-consuming. Imagine this son in torn and tattered rags. He had nothing on his feet, we're told in the passage. And the smell. Can you imagine the smell? He had been feeding pigs. Now, I've raised pigs. I'm from the Midwest, and I've had a lot of pigs. And I've worked on a big hog operation where I had to fill a large manure spreader twice in the day and then take it to the fields to empty it. Do not look back when you're running a manure spreader. There's some farm sense for you. Because you'll feel splatter on the back of your head. Yeah. The number two son was seen by his father down the road in his stinking pig smell. And what did the father do? He ran to him. He embraced him. 
He threw his arms around his stinking son's body and hugged him closely. He kissed his dirty face because he loved him. And here's the key. In the condition the son was in before he ever cleaned up his life. Wow. The example of the father is that he meets his lost children where they are and loves them there first. The father did not wait for the son to come knocking. The father ran to his son to meet his son where his son was. This wayward son who had taken one half of the estate and squandered it away. He foolishly lost one half of all the father had owned. Yet the father gave again to him the best robe to cover his naked, pink, stinking body, the family signet ring, and a fresh pair of sandals for his bare, pink, stinking feet. The father's, the loving father always forgives. What will the kingdom of heaven be like? I've thought long and hard about this. Please do not make this text say what is not there. We do not see absolute open acceptance of tolerance of sin by the Father here. That's not what this is about. The kingdom of heaven will be like the Father who loves and forgives everyone who wants to admit that they have been wrong and wants to return to the love and care of home. But there is one more very important point Jesus makes in this illustration, the story he teaches us. The Father includes the faithful. He does not ignore number one son. He does not brush him off as inconsequential. And he does not take him for granted. He embraces him too. Oftentimes we focus on the number one son's initial reaction to his younger brother's return and the father's undeserved lavish love on the number two son. We like to focus on the initial reaction of the number one son's sibling rivalry. But we do not read that the number one son hated his brother. He was simply frustrated with the situation. I've been doing all this work. I've been here and he's playing around and you help him out? As so often is the case with those who are very good at being responsible. They feel everyone should see things from their perspective and be responsible too, just like them. But you forget, I'm a number two son. But the father reminds his number one son of his position. He gets everything. Do not miss the father's words to the first son. You want a fatted calf? You want a goat, son? You have everything. Everything I have is yours. And I like to imagine, hot and sweaty from his work, the number one son wipes his brow, Receives a hug from his dad, too. Whoa, dad, you smell like pigs. And the number one son walks arm in arm into the party to welcome his wayward, broken brother home. What will the kingdom of heaven be like? Our father will be looking down the road for us to return to him. He will run to meet us and welcome us in. There will be an amazing celebration because at one time, each and every one of us was a wayward son or daughter. Each of us went our own way and rebelled from our loving father. He waits, looking to welcome us home. Let's bow our heads for a moment, if you would, please. Can you see the image of God Jesus tries to teach you that you're never too far from God's love, that you cannot return to Him, that you cannot return home. He looks for your return. He has compassion on you and meets you on the road back to Him. There's a great celebration when that which is lost is found, when that which was for sure dead is found to be alive. Both sons knew home was the place to turn in times of trouble. Do you? 
What is the kingdom of heaven like? God sees the value of a lost child. Know this about the character and nature of God. He loves those who are lost to him. And then let me leave you with a question. How do your children, especially those who are not serving the Lord, those who are not walking with Jesus, how do they perceive you who are followers of Jesus? Are you like this father? Are you like this image that Jesus tries to teach these religious right who were accusing Jesus of hanging around with pig stinking sinners? How do people who are lost to God, how do they see you thinking of them? Are you compassionate towards them before they even clean up their act? Are you including them? Father, you speak to our hearts this morning with this incredible story of a prodigal, a wayward son who came back to the Father. Jesus teaches us that story so that we can see you through bigger eyes. That you're loving and you're caring and your greatest desire is to embrace us in our pig stinking filth and love us back to you. Help us, God, to see people who are lost to you like you see them, of great value, with great love. So, Lord, as we go into a fellowship time and we go beyond this, we ask, Lord, not only that you would bless the food and our fellowship, but you would make us mindful that there are people all around us that might not be walking with you like we would think they should. And I pray that you would help us to see them through your eyes, with the love that comes from knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray.